With the latest agriculture news from across the state and nation, it's time for the AgNet News Hour from AgNet West. Here's your host, Sabrina Halbertson. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today on the AgNet News Hour. Coming up later, concerns are raised over UFW's use of farm and food worker relief funds. We'll have more on that story. But we start today with the livestock sector. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association is urging the House to follow the Senate's lead and pass a resolution to block beef imports from Paraguay. The Senate did so last week. NCBA's Vice President of Government Affairs, Ethan Lane, says Paraguay has been an issue for the industry for a number of years. Well, Paraguay has had a history of problems uh, in their past with uh, animal disease control issues. I, uh, you know, that's not uh, unique to uh, to to Paraguay and South America. Other countries in South America and throughout that region uh, have had their struggles over the year as well. Um, but obviously, you know, when you have anything coming uh, from those areas of the world that that have had those issues, uh, whether it be foot and mouth disease (BSE) or whatever else, uh, to the United States. Um, you know, we in the industry here take an extremely uh, sharp eye to to any kind of discussion about a trade relationship uh, in the beef supply chain with those countries. So uh, the announcement that uh, USDA was going to allow fresh beef from Paraguay back into the United States, uh, having not been on site to inspect uh, those uh, uh, those facilities in country since uh, for FSIS and APHIS 2009 and 2014, respectively, uh, that for our producers around the country is unacceptable. It's it's uh, simply too long to have waited 10 years since your last on-site inspection before uh, potentially risking uh, any kind of problems in the U.S. supply chain uh, uh, from a foreign country importing fresh beef into the United States uh, without proper uh, uh, oversight and inspection. I spoke with Lane last week after the Senate resolution, and we talked about USDA inspections for beef imports. Well, so I, you know, that's USDA's uh, commitment and and promise to uh, to all of us in the in the in the industry. Uh, Certainly, we've heard that as well with other countries that are potentially problematic, like Brazil, uh, enhanced inspection um, and and, uh, in some cases, 100 percent inspection of any shipments coming into the country. Um, those uh, those inspections, were they to find anything problematic, would be immediately rejected, and then I believe at that point uh, access would be suspended uh, for that country into the United States. Um, similar to if there was a problem with our product going into another country overseas. Um, so you know that inspection process is a is a good one. Our 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 folks that that monitor uh, uh, shipments coming in and out at APHIS are uh, as good as it gets, um, and and we have uh, you know full faith and confidence in their ability to do that job. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things where we want to make sure we're being cautious and we want to make sure we're being extremely complete in our uh, uh, assessment of those trading partners. And in this case, we don't believe uh, that that, uh, you know, sort of 10 year gap in, in boots on the ground inspection meets that standard. Yeah, I'm really curious about the 10 year gap um, because I I thought that these inspections happened much more frequently than that. Um, am I incorrect on that? Well, they should they should be. You know, obviously, COVID um, resulted in a, a several year gap there where no uh, overseas inspections were really, I don't think, happening. I could be wrong about that, but at least as far as I know, um, you know, and USDA has has said, gosh, you know, even though we haven't had boots on the ground, we have certainly been updating information and and you know monitoring. Uh, their their uh, their systems in country and and keeping an eye on things. Um, you know. Certainly, they feel like they have done things and taken actions internally that sort of meet that uh, meet that that threshold uh, through means other than uh, physically placing people on the ground, uh, you know, uh, with with clipboards, for lack of a better description. Um, but for us, uh, you know, some good old fashioned inspections and and legwork uh, would go a long way towards easing uh, our producers' concerns. And right now, those concerns are not eased. He explained there was a lengthy public comment period before USDA made its decision. Sure, there there was a process where during which we we voiced our concerns very loudly, um, and and you know what we were told by the administration, and it wasn't just us; it was every cattle association, uh, not you know I'm aware of, I, I you know, and that includes groups that I almost never see eye to eye on any issue. Um, all are in unison on this one um, that that this is just a, a, an unacceptable move from USDA. Those opinions were voiced during the process. Those opinions have been voiced to the secretary directly uh, from my organization uh, as, as well as others. Um, so uh, you know, yes, those that that feedback has been provided loud and clear, and 
I, you know, what, what the administration has told us and has told Capitol Hill is that that is an important uh, diplomatic relationship there in Paraguay. Um, and, and there were some other issues that they felt like they needed to uh, assist Paraguay with, in particular, um, some punitive action from Russia in the wake of Paraguay's support of Ukraine. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of sort of larger diplomatic issues at play there. Um, and that's been part of our concern there is, you know, we, we don't want the U.S. Uh, beef supply chain uh, to be used as sort of a peace offering in a larger uh, political negotiation. We would prefer that the focus stay on, on what's best for the, uh, for the beef supply chain here in the United States. And Lane said the Senate vote last week was significant. We're, we're at a time in Washington for anyone watching the news that I think that they realize that uh, basically these, these folks back here don't agree on anything right now, but they were able to pass uh, a Congressional Re- Review Act resolution disapproving of, uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, the, the opening of Paraguay uh, for, to the U.S. market um, by a vote of 70 to 25 this week in the U.S. Senate. Um, that's a, a pretty resounding rejection of, uh, of the administration's uh, decision here to allow Paraguay into the United States. Um, you know, that's bipartisan, obviously, by a, a pretty healthy margin um, that that I, I that CRA now will need to uh, be processed in the House of Representatives as well. Obviously, uh, they're having their own challenges this week with a, a renewed motion to vacate on the uh, the new speaker um, and, and other hurdles to overcome in that body. Um, but I think it speaks to the bipartisan nature of concern here um, from uh, senators and members of Congress representing cattle producers around the country. He points out a House vote may be much harder to get. You know, I, I we, we're going to have to wait and see uh, if if uh, uh, the House can resolve this week's uh, crisis of confidence in uh, uh, in themselves um, before I think any real focus is going to is going to be uh, uh, redirected to uh, the issues of the American people. Sadly, we find ourselves uh, once again uh, to some extent being held hostage by uh, you know 20 members of the Freedom Caucus who don't know how to share their toys. So we're going to have to wait for that to be uh, uh, you know resolved once again. Um, before uh, those, uh, uh, you know, 100 plus members of the House Republican Conference that are, are, are truly trying to do the work of cattle producers and farmers and ranchers and folks all over the country uh, can, can get back to doing that work. You're listening to the AgNet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. In today's national spotlight, U.S. agricultural trade with Cuba continues to be very limited. Here's Gary Crawford. The island of Cuba has to import 80% of its food supply, but very little of those imports come from the U.S. There's a significant uh, impediment to trade in Cuba. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack told a Capitol Hill hearing the other day that the impediment's in the form of... Legislation that requires essentially payment in advance in cash in in U.S. dollars, which makes it very, very difficult for um, a lot of ag trade to take place. Bill Sack said every so often, U.S. state ag secretaries or commissioners will go over to Cuba on a trade mission, but with very limited success. There's obviously a market there. Uh, it's just a question of whether you can remove that barrier and make it a little bit easier from a business perspective to do business in Cuba. This is Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration gave its outlook regarding potential spring flood activity for this season with perhaps a surprising report. Here's Rod Bain with more information. Once called the Spring Flood Outlook, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration removed the word flood from its weather outlook for the season. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says for spring 2024, that is appropriate in that... We are not expecting any significant spring flooding across the northern plains or the upper Midwest, a big departure from what we normally see in these outlooks. As a combination of antecedent drought the past three years and below average snowfall over the winter is expected to result in no flooding in that region. In other parts of the country, there are very few areas expecting any moderate flooding and nowhere in the United States expecting major spring river flooding. Those pockets of potential moderate flooding mostly focused across the Mid-South and then in just a few areas in the Southeast. One minor flood risk area this spring, some watersheds in the Great Basin extending into southeastern Idaho. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. A sound vaccination program is crucial to any cattle operation, especially when it comes to preparing calves for spring turnout. Chad Smith reports. 
Dr. D.L. Stepp is a professional services veterinarian for Beringer Ingelheim. An early vaccination program for calves can amplify herd health, and he talks about the challenges calves can face around spring turnout. They can be moved to different locations, so environment can change. And like drought-type situations, not only nutrition for them, but nutrition to their mothers can be stressful situation, along with other environmental factors such as water and dust and wind can kind of be stressful on a, an immune system type of a situation for the animals to respond. Generally, around spring turnout, the calves get processed and different veterinary type procedures from maybe even castration to vaccination, deworming can be another stressor on those animals. With stress, it can make them a little more susceptible to various potential pathogens, which are disease causing agents, especially the respiratory tract, leading to uh, pneumonia. Producers can take steps to keep their calves healthy during turnout and beyond. It starts with good quality and quantity of colostrum. We know that if an animal does not get adequate transfer of the colostrum or the first milk from the mother to the calf, that those animals will experience a higher rate of various illnesses throughout their lives. And that colostrum provides that passive immunity. As that passive immunity or passive protection will decline over time, then we need to kind of follow up and stimulate those individuals' own immune system. And we generally do that through vaccination programs so they can produce their own level of immunity. When preparing for spring calf vaccination, Step says there are several de- details to keep in mind. It starts with producers working together closely with their veterinarians. They can work to customize a preventive health program that is customized to their specific operations. So we want to look for generally a five-way modified live viral vaccine, working with the veterinarian to make sure that it is appropriate for that management on that particular herd so we can get those individual young calves, their immune system primed for if there is a challenge later on. Another thing is it's very important to do is read those labels, great information on them, how to store the product, how to properly mix up the product, the correct dose, and even the route of administration. It's also important to make sure you follow the beef quality assurance guidelines. Again, that's Dr. D.L. Stepp of Beringer Ingelheim. Chad Smith reporting. Remember, if you've missed any of our morning shows or if you just want to catch the news on your own schedule, you can subscribe to our podcast and have our statewide agriculture news at your convenience. Just search for the Agnet News Hour wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. This is the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson, and we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Coming up in a few moments, we'll have today's This Land of Ours report, but first, more of the day's agriculture news. And with today's Agnet West headlines, here's Agnet West Farm News Director Brian German. The recently patented prune cultivar UC YOLO Gold offers growers a new unique option for production. Manager of the prune breeding program at UC Davis, Sarah Castro, said the cultivar has been generating a good deal of excitement for some time now as it has several attributes that set it apart from improved French. Yellow gold is a little larger than improved French, and we've seen less heat damage. Last year, there was a lot of heat damage in improved French, and we've seen less heat damage in yellow gold. The flavor of it is unique and superior to improved French, so it's really fun to give out samples of this item, just anecdotally, because people who don't like prunes tend to like it, and it's something that I have really liked as a product for years. And now that we have pitted product from Mariani and other processors, It's really fun to have samples to give to lots of people. Bayer has introduced a pilot program for its Gen AI system, utilizing agronomic data to train a large language model for quick and accurate answers to questions related to agronomy, farm management, and Bayer agricultural products. The system aims to streamline decision-making for farmers and agronomists by providing expert information within seconds. Developed in collaboration with Microsoft as the leading technology partner and Ernst & Young as an industry partner, the Gen AI system will be integrated into Bayer's digital offerings. Additionally, Bayer has expanded its strategic partnership with Microsoft to provide ready-made capabilities for the agri-food industry, including Bayer Historical Weather, which offers comprehensive weather insights and a connector for accessing irrigation data from Lindsay Corporation. The cloud offerings support regulatory compliance, sustainability reporting, and innovation in digital farming. 
The National Council of Agricultural Employers has expressed frustration over allegations of misuse of USDA's Farm and Food Worker Relief Grant Program. The program is meant to provide relief payments to farm workers as a result of challenges created by the COVID-19 pandemic. Last year, the council notified USDA about actions taken by United Farm Workers in New York, where workers were allegedly required to sign union cards to receive payments. Despite assurances from USDA, the council has highlighted similar allegations that have since been made in California, with farm workers claiming deception by UFW organizers. The council's urging USDA's Office of Inspector General to investigate the misuse claims. Council President and CEO Michael Marsh said that USDA entrusted the UFW Foundation with nearly $98 million, and those funds should be fairly distributed to workers, regardless of union affiliation. It looks like it's going to be a good year for California cotton. President and CEO of the California Cotton Ginners and Growers Association, Roger Isom, said it's still a little early, but there are indicators pointing to a positive outlook for the year. I think people know there's going to be more water this year. Acreage is going to be up. We haven't completed our survey yet, but based on what has been submitted so far, we are probably at least 50 percent more than last year and maybe even higher than that. It's yet to be seen, but we might even get close to doubling the acres we had last year. I think it'll be hard to get there, but it's going to be close. Cotton planting is also more attractive this year based on other commodity prices. I think that's one of the big reasons, not just having water, but what else are you going to grow? You know, most people are telling me that, you know, whether it's tomatoes or garlic or onions or, you know, corn silage, a lot of things that guys moved to last year just aren't there this year. So I think you're going to see a lot of transition back to cotton. The Westlands Water District is once again offering assistance to high school seniors pursuing higher education. The Westlands Water District Board of Directors has again expanded the scholarship program to award up to a total of $21,000 scholarships to graduating seniors from local Westside high schools in 2024. Students will be evaluated based on their application, essay, academic transcripts, reference letters, demonstrated leadership, contributions to local communities, career goals, and need. Each scholarship recipient will receive $1,000 to be used for accredited post-secondary education expenses. All applications and supporting documents will need to be submitted to the Westlands Water District website before April 22nd. Over the past 19 years, the district has supported over 120 students in the pursuit of their academic goals. I'm Brian German for Agnet West Radio Network. Why, knowing more about mosquito biology... Will help in controlling them. That's coming up on This Land of Ours. Using a mosquito's own biology to control these pests. Penn State University Extension's Jamie Kopko says that is indeed an important consideration regarding control strategies. One example is how far a specific mosquito species can fly. Some species, especially the ones that kind of go for those real small breeding areas, they tend to stay close to home. So they might never travel more than one or 200 yards their entire life. So if you can find where they're breeding and clean that up, you might make a big difference on how many mosquitoes you've got. Where other species of mosquitoes will fly for miles, and especially if like a storm system rolls through, the wind might blow them some. So you can be like, we're getting hit by all these mosquitoes all summer long, and we can't find any breeding sites. Well, yeah, their breeding site might actually be a marshy area two miles upwind and they're all just blowing in. There are also potential mosquito treatment methods based on biology homeowners can perform on their own. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Well, here's a status report on programs designed to boost U.S. food processing capacity. Here's Gary Crawford. What is the status of USDA's efforts to expand food processing capacity in this country? There are four aspects of our initiative in processing. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack telling a House Appropriations Subcommittee about some of the various programs. First, there's the Processing Expansion Grant Program, and on that score... There's another round of processing expansion grants that will be issued by the uh, foundation that has the resources in the, yep. making the decision-making. Uh, you'll probably see those in the next couple of months. Secondly, there is a relending program to create an opportunity for additional credit for those who want to expand or create processing. And there are so-called readiness grants. We did uh, a number of readiness grants where we enabled existing facilities to expand their markets beyond state, state borders. And Vilsack said there are other grant programs geared to creation or expansion of small processing operations. So over the next six months, you're going to continue to see an expansion of, of processing. This is Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. Here's Cindy Zimmerman. 
first of all, if you would, please introduce yourself. My name is Austin Valancourt, Senior Business Manager from GIVO. Well, you are here at the ACE Fly-In here in Washington, D.C. This is your first experience here. What did you think of it? Oh, well, I was just telling Brian that, for one, I think just being in D.C. is, uh, it, it, you, you, you have this energy, right? So just being here has been great. I think, uh, yeah, I had some great time with, with various senators and, and, and Congress people's staffers and uh, had opportunities to explain to them the, the things that we're concerned about here at GIVO and more broadly for ACE and uh, really focused on the, the, the tax credit discussions and and how how we can you know best serve serve them and and what they're looking to to get over the line and and be a resource to them but also advocate for the policies that we think uh should be advocated for and that's really going back down to the field level and measuring the the activities at the field level and translating those benefits down through the the full, full supply chain to the biofuel well of course jivo is one of the big names in the business right now what uh, what's the latest news on jivo well we're you know we're still actively pursuing the the financing of our first commercial facility net zero one um, and so we're in, in the process of that we're working with the doe uh, loan loan program office and so um, that's a going through the due diligence process right now um, but you know things are are progressing in the right direction um, that'll be the once we reach financial investment decision that'll be the, the when the clock starts uh, for the construction of the facility. So, um, you know, we've got the contracts in hands to substantiate that build out and just a matter of working through those financing steps. To, we've got the engineering done. Um, so uh, once, yeah, once we re- re- get through those due diligence efforts, the the plant build will really kick off and then the clock starts. So, Well, how important is the current uh, effort to get the GREET model right for those SAF credits, tax credits that are in the IRA for GIVO going forward? Yeah, sure. That's, I mean, it's critically important. Um, it's, it really comes down to just having certainty. And so um, right now, the lack of certainty as to how, how much value is available in those tax credits and in, in, in the final rule has it will be written, particularly as it relates to those on-farm practices and, and the climate smart agricultural practices that uh, we believe should be incorporated, and then also the the land use change. So how they will be uh, evaluating the land use change element of the carbon intensity score. But ultimately, yeah, having certainty around what that looks like um, is critically important for us to model out the financial economics and performance of this facility, where we're we're seeking investment. And so without that clear picture, it's it's really hard for investors to um, make that decision m- moving forward. And so until we, ha- until we have ruling around that, I think it's going to be challenging um, to, to move forward. And so we really are eagerly awaiting the, the rules that are we're, – we're, we're, so, we're supposed to uh, be set March 1st for 40B, as, as, and, and we would look to, look to that as kind of – expectations for 40 the impending 45z how much are you doing working with farmers as far as adopting climate smart agriculture practices yeah so we have a climate smart commodities grant a 30 million dollar grant from the usda so we are actively working through that and it's a it's a on a daily basis we're working with growers so we've got a a team right now that uh interfaces uh with the, with the growers both in the Lake Preston area where we have our facility or we, we will have our, our Net Zero One facility and then uh, with our USDA project partner Southwest Iowa Renewable Energy Sire uh, we also have a network of growers in their area that we're working with uh, yeah to, to get them signed on um, meet them where they're at it's, it's really a great program that doesn't require them to change any practices and they can immediately start getting compensated for those practices that they've already got uh, deployed on farm today, um, and so yeah, it's it's very it, it, it's a that's a great program that one in particular uh, around the USDA, um, and then more broadly, you know, we're we need to do that for our business, and so that's something that we're focused on. I will say we started prior to the USDA award building that network around Lake Preston, and uh, we've had. 100% retention rate in the grower program that we, we've kicked off. So year over year, so that was back in 22, I think. 
if I'm remembering this correctly. And then in 23, we had 100% retention uh, in, in that grower season. So things seem to be working well. There seems to be a good understanding between you know the leads over there and and the growers just kind of driving that that relationship and building that trust anything else you want to add no just express gratitude and thanks to the ace organization for putting this together and it was just a good first experience to journey through the the various government buildings fortunately i had my director of government affairs kathy bergren here who this is her stomping ground so i was able to tag along but just a great experience. It's, it's always useful to hear the feedback that we receive in these conversations uh, with staffers um, and, and others here in the room today. So got a good opportunity to exchange with other ethanol plant owners and, and those in, involved in ethanol plant operations and just hearing the feedback, the things that they're concerned about um, and some of the, you know, the skepticism that they've heard in their exchanges around climate smart agriculture. And it just really helps us kind of address those concerns, right, as we go out to the market and look to really deploy this and gain benefits and provide those benefits back to the growers where, where we think they deserve. So you've got a lot of good insights here then to bring back to your company. Yeah, definitely, yeah. All right, excellent. Well, great to see you here at the Ace fly in Washington, D.C. I'm Cindy Zimmerman. This is the Agnet News Hour, and we will be back in just a moment with more agriculture news. For today's featured interview, I'm talking with Fran Miller with the Center of Agriculture and Food Studies at the Vermont Law and Graduate School. We wanted to talk about the Farm Bill today. It seems to be almost common practice these days with the Farm Bill that it was delayed. From last year, it was supposed to be the 2023 Farm Bill. Now we're working on the 2024 Farm Bill. But I'm wondering from your perspective and with your expertise, how do you see the Farm Bill progressing now? I mean, like I said, we've had many that have been delayed in the past, but what are your thoughts on it so far? Well, the word that I have from people who deal with folks on the Hill is that it's pretty questionable whether we'll have a 2024 farm bill and that it could actually go into 2025 after the election. So I think nobody knows. And there's still so much work that Congress has to do around appropriations while they passed USDA appropriations and FDA appropriations and some other things. There's still some big work to be done. And it's hard to imagine that they're going to get to the farm bill until that is all resolved. And then there's recesses and, you know, Congress takes their breaks and it's just not clear that it's going to happen this year. That's that's my intel anyway. You know, honestly, I'm hearing the same thing um, as well. The, many people are, are thinking it's going to be after the elections because it is hard to get a major bill like the farm bill passed during the election cycle. So. As we're looking at farm bill discussions continue about, you know, what's important to have in the farm bill, what should be funded more, what should be funded less. There's the continuing question that some have of if we should split the nutrition title away from the other agricultural titles. I would love to hear your thoughts on what would happen if that were to happen, if we were to split the nutrition title off into its own bill. Um, I've had other opinions, but I would like to hear from your perspective. Well, I know that the conventional wisdom is that these two pieces of policy were put together originally because it got Congress working together, rural and urban, or farm-oriented states and more urban-oriented states, although a lot of states are both, so I'm not sure about that. I think that probably still does do that especially given the partisanship that exists right now and all of the forces combined to create a lot of extreme positions on these things. And I think I'm of the mind that it needs to stay together in order to get done. I think maybe an example of that might be the WIC, the Recent Women, Infant and Child Appropriation that did end up getting through in the appropriations process, but I'm not on the Hill. I'm sure there was a lot of wheeling and dealing to get those things through. And I think there were a couple of compromises, you know, on all sides to get that through. And it does seem like in our supercharged partisan atmosphere, it has to be together. And I think that if it wasn't, 
it's not clear that either one of them could get through and get redone. And that would be tragedy. Yeah. And you mentioned it with the super partisan atmosphere that we have. Now, it could be just my perception. I could be wrong, but it feels to me like we're more separated now than we have been in the past. I know, in fact, that there have been times in our history when we have been even more separated. Mm -hmm. But there really feels like there's this big partisan divide right now. In your perspective, is that making things more difficult for getting this farm bill passed? We do hear, and I report on a lot of the back and forth, you know, this side wants this and that side wants that. With how divided politics are right now, is that making it more difficult? I think that it is, Sabrina. I think the American people are much less divided than Congress is. And that's really a shame that the American people aren't getting the representation of their interests in the halls of Congress in, you know, amongst the powers that be. I do think there's a lot of forces that create that partisan divide, but it does feel to me as well that it's crazy right now. And anybody who allows or supports a policy that is deemed to be the other side's policy gets pummeled by their side. And that's terrible for American democracy. And it's not representative of the American people. I really, truly feel that people are so much less divided. And I'm not sure what we do about that. I really tend to agree with you on that. So when we're talking about just the people in general as a whole, yeah, it seems like we are less divided than how we're represented currently. Yeah. Um, and just just one thing to add to that, I think I think that shows up in agriculture. I think that, you know, people talk about farmers as if it's monolithic, and obviously it's not. There are different kinds of farmers. There are large farmers and small farmers. There are a diversity. I mean, honestly, there should be more diversity amongst farmers, but we'll leave that one aside for the moment. I don't think farmers with each other are as divided as leadership, as congressional leadership. I think that the larger farmers likely want small farmers to have more, more access to USDA, more access to land, et cetera. I don't think any farmer doesn't want another farmer to make a living and be viable. It supports them all. And I think that's just true across the board. We are talking with Fran Miller, an expert at the Center of Agriculture and Food Studies at the Vermont Law and Graduate School. You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. We continue talking now with Fran Miller from the Center of Agriculture and Food Studies at the Vermont Law and Graduate School. Well, let's talk about some of the things that are in the Farm Bill. And I know a couple of things that, from what I understand, are really top of your interest, too. And the new focus on some sustainability, some climate mitigation issues. What are some things that we should be looking at in the Farm Bill? So the work that I do tends to be supportive to smaller farmers and more sustainable farmers, farmers who are really focused on ecologically good practices and younger farmers and beginning farmers. And so there's a few different marker bills have been introduced that we at CAFS have contributed to in some way. We don't advocate but we do provide a lot of legal and policy support to those that do. So one of our partners is the National Family Farm Coalition, and we've done a variety of policy work for them. And one of the bills that they are pressing for and that we worked on is called the Farmland for Farmers Act. Corporate consolidation is a big issue in farmland, right? And Congress, I think in a probably a nonpartisan or bipartisan way, actually, have been focusing on some of the foreign investors in farmlands. But in my opinion, that really ignores the bigger issue in America, which is corporate consolidation, domestic corporations, and ways that land is being treated as a commodity, as an investment vehicle. And there's Lots of examples of that, if you look at some of the ads that are coming out from some of these multinationals, multi-layered subsidiaries, as they're called, which are really just buying land for investment purposes. And it's 
decimating to rural communities. It's not a good thing. And it prevents younger farmers and farmers with less capital to purchase land. It takes people out of rural communities, sends them off in other places. And so this is one of the bills. It restricts corporations and multi-layered subsidiaries, pension funds, investment funds from purchasing and leasing land and getting USDA subsidies, most importantly, because that's one of the ways that you know they're really supported in owning of the land. There's exceptions, plenty of exceptions for people who are really doing the farming, but it does get at this issue of corporate investment. That's one of the bills. Explain the difference, or let's talk about the difference between a large corporation that is getting into farming versus a large farm or a large family farm. Is there a difference um, as far as you're concerned in the two? I think that what this bill tries to prevent is the large corporation that's really just using it as an investment vehicle. I think the large family farmer is making a living and doing it in the way that they can and they know how and historically have. I might challenge the need for thousands and thousands of acres and some of the ways that those commodities get sold, And but we're not going down that road right now. I do believe that a large corporation or a large investment fund that is investing in land and then leasing it to a local farmer at the highest price possible is terrible incentive. It doesn't incentivize the farmer to use good practices that cost more money. It doesn't incentivize the farmer to spend more money locally. The farmer doesn't own the land, and so it doesn't incentivize them to build soil health. It's bad practice, in my opinion. And it's really also, there's been studies that have been done that show that farmland prices are increasing tremendously. And I think that it's keeping the younger generation off the land when the average age of farmers is growing. I think the latest was all the census of ag, I think it was close to 60. We need that younger generation to be feeding us. That's my thoughts on that. You kind of hinted at it, but I was going to ask, what does that do to the availability of farmland and the accessibility, I guess, of farmland for younger farmers or new farmers or underserved farmers, are we losing some of these who could be the next rising generation of farmers? I think we are, Sabrina. The National Young Farmers Coalition for a number of years in a row has surveyed young farmers across America. And the number one challenge that young farmers face is land access. And it can only hurt them that land prices, let's see, the number of institutionally owned properties rose threefold from 2009 to 2022. And the market value of that property increased from less than $2 billion to over $14 billion in the same time period. So it's really preventing young farmers from accessing land. It's also preventing existing farmers from expanding their operations. So they're successful, they're making a living, they're selling product, they want to expand. A big corporate investor comes in and can bid so much higher than they can on that land. And it's really unjust, really unfair. How do we fight this? What is the proper path to take to turn this around? Well, the Farm Bill is supposed to be a path. Whether it is or not remains to be seen. But this bill does exist. I know the National Family Farm Coalition is working hard to get co-sponsors on the bill and make sure that some of the language at least makes it into the farm bill. One of the ways that these kinds of laws have been challenged is on the state level, large corporate interests like Smithfield, also Chinese, foreign, have really chipped away at state laws that are anti-corporate farming laws in the Midwest, especially. And this bill would make it so that every state in the country has to enforce at least as restrictive a law as the Farmland for Farmers Act is. And so it would take away the ability of these large, mostly domestic, I, I don't want to pick out Smithfield for being Chinese, it really is mostly U.S. multinational corporations that are doing this, and it would prevent them from doing that. Thank you again to Fran Miller at the Center of Agriculture and Food Studies at the Vermont Law and Graduate School. 
That's today's top agriculture news. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Thank you for sharing your morning with us. To get more information on the topics you heard today, visit Agnet West online at agnetwest.com. You can also stay connected by following us on our social media at Agnet West on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find our broadcast team of Brian German and Sabrina Halvertson on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for listening to the Agnet News Hour from Agnet West. Agnet West Radio Network, your primary choice for agriculture news.